Welcome to Stewardology, a podcast where two worlds collide. In this show, financial advisor Tim Russell and Reverend Drew Geisey come together to explore the intersection of financial stewardship and theology. Their unique perspectives help Christians and churches understand and apply a biblical framework for everyday financial decisions, so Christians everywhere can improve and strengthen their walk with Christ through biblical stewardship. Before we get started, we just wanted you to know that the topics discussed in this podcast are for general information only and are not intended to provide specific investment advice or recommendations. Investing and investment strategies involve risk, including the potential loss of principal. Past performance is not a guarantee of future results. Securities and advisory services are offered through Genius Wealth Management, member FINRA and CIPIC. Without further ado, here are your hosts, Tim Russell and Drew Geisey. I'm Tim Russell. And I'm Pastor Drew Geisey. And we welcome you to episode 118 of the, the Stewardology, Stewardology Podcast. Podcast. Well, Tim, I think we have officially gone over the edge Today in the Stewardology Podcast, we're going to be talking about time bombs. Now, Tim, I have seen many of them on TV through the years. I've even enjoyed seeing them on various cartoons, but I must say I'm not one that understands or is good at making or thinking about time bombs. So with that in mind, I need to defer to you. You must know something more than I know about this stuff, so I presume you have a good history with time no, bombs? Drew, 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 Drew. We're not talking about the Roadrunner and all of the cartoon versions of time bombs. I like those. We're, we're not talking about like the 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 imaginary bomb with the fuse going down about to explode. They're not no, no, imaginary. No, no, no. They're real. Um, what we're dealing with are financial planning time bombs. Oh. Let me explain. Okay, please. What is the time bomb here that we're referring to? Well, I think the time bomb really is lack of organization and a cohesive financial plan, Mm. any kind of cohesiveness. That makes sense. So why is that a time bomb? Let me paint a picture. You go through life. You you work a couple of jobs. You've got some 401ks. Maybe you go to an attorney someday because you, you know you're supposed to. You go to like LegalZoom.com or one of those other self-service places and you create a will. You're you're working with uh, your homeowner's insurance person. You know you need homeowner's insurance, so you get that. And then then maybe you go with someone else, you get some life insurance. And you go to someone else and you get this taken care of and that taken care of. And, and there's – Lots of different things you're doing. You know that you've got to do things, but there's no cohesiveness with how they all fit together. Mm. In fact, the problem is that there are things that you could have done, should have done, that you didn't even know that you needed to do. Yeah. Because there was no one looking at the big picture. When you got your will, no one mentioned you should also have a power of attorney. Right. When you um w- when you did your your homeowner's insurance and got your 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 life insurance, no one said but, but does that version of insurance make sense? Maybe you should use term insurance because of cost and budgets and prioritization in other areas. You're saving for retirement, you have 15 different 401ks and they're so scattered around that you don't know how to manage them, what you're holding or how they're doing. Or maybe you're doing all of that and you haven't even thought about tax impact of your retirement savings, maybe starting Roth IRAs or doing Roth conversions. So there's so many ways that our lack of awareness uh, of all of the financial dealings of our life can become a hidden Time bomb. It's ticking away. We're holding it. We don't even know it's there. And it's about to explode and cause a big mess for us, for our spouse, and for those we leave behind. So in today's episode, we're going to take a good look at the big picture of financial stewardship, the six elements of complete wealth management and financial stewardship. Our goal is to use these six elements to diffuse the time bomb. And the first element is wealth management. Tim, speak to that for us. So this is an interesting element. Wealth wealth manager, I, I'm a wealth manager. That's one of my job titles. So wealth management is is not simply about taking your money and investing it. That's that's actually another one of the elements we can use to define to diffuse the time bomb. We'll get to in a minute investment planning or investment management. We're dealing with wealth management, which deals with you as a whole. 
not just your money, but the big picture. So we start with this one because this is, this is probably the most important, the most commonly missed element. If, if you do nothing else, getting this piece in place is going to help make sure some of the other elements to diffuse the time bomb are also being put in place. So as an advisor, we help disciple families in their stewardship responsibilities, right? Mm, that's that that's makes one of the big roles. We, we want to work with families about their stewardship responsibilities. In episode 99, we spoke about the value of, of working with a financial advisor um, to help steward your assets, right? So there's, there's an element of not just how do you invest the stuff, the money well, but how do you steward those assets well, which means how do you think about it? How do you deal with challenges and problems? How do you deal with fear and greed? Those are the important elements that a wealth manager is going to help work with you on. The the next part is education. Wealth manager is an educator. There's someone who's able to help you understand how everything works, how it works together, how you can apply the word of God in the realities of your financial life. So you need to have the education. And then the final component, and it's tied very closely with education about stewardship, and it's there, there's an educational factor with regard to your kids. So how, how do you make sure that you're preparing the next generation of stewards. It's, it's not just about you being a good steward today, but how do we make sure that we're transferring that stewardship responsibility? Well, that we're preparing them well for their role as a steward. And if you listen to our last episode, we just talked about uh, two episodes ago, we talked about like, how do we talk to our kids about money and how do we train them up? Well, well, all of that is it's, it's in preparation for this. How do we transfer it effectively to the next generation requires them to be prepared. And a wealth manager, they're, they're looking at the whole. They're not just looking at one little myopic thing. And part of our stewardship, am I right in saying this, Tim? It's not just the stewarding of what we have today of assets and items and wealth, but it's a large part of that is to transfer when we have that graduation date to glory. It's making sure that what God has allowed us to take and steward and use, that it would continue that same pattern as best as we can in our absence. Am I right in saying that, Tim? And that's where the education comes in. Yes, 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 absolutely. That's that's the whole preparing them. Yeah. Are, you, are, are they prepared? And Tim, is that a challenge as a financial professional, the parents are usually bought in. That's why they come and they sit down with you. What are maybe a challenge or two that you see when it comes to preparing the transfer of wealth to the next generation? Uh, If the kids just aren't on board or whatever, what are some of the challenges that you face? Culturally, our kids are different than us. They grew up in a different time, in a different era, with different cultural Values. I don't mean biblical values, although that certainly can be the case at times. I'm talking more about um, the kids this, these days. They don't deal with emails. They don't look at emails. They'd rather not have anyone email them. They'd rather everything be in texts. Yes. Right. That's a cultural difference. Right. It's not right or wrong. It's just different. It is. Um, yeah. Because of some of those differences, learning how to work well with the kids can be challenging. Mm. Um, maybe, maybe the kids, you know, they, they say, you know, you're a, you're a, uh, the, the apple doesn't fall far from the tree. Yeah, you're yeah. a, you know, chip off the old block, that kind of thing. Well, sometimes it's like, boy, <laughs> something got missed with this one. Yeah. Uh, like the, <laughs> he, he is not like his, his father or his yeah. mother, um, in just in terms of their values and their priorities, their temperament. Um, you, you know, I mentioned this when I was talking about my own children. One is one way and another is another way, saver and spender. And um, you know, not right or wrong. It's just it's natural tendency. So we've got to train and, and work with that. Well, how does that work if they get to adulthood and they haven't learned how to address that? So one of the sad things we see is parents working so diligently all of their life to save up this money. They make it to the end. They leave money for their kids and their kids get the money. And then um, 
it becomes used for lifestyle or to um, buy the toys mm. rather than really doing good lasting legacy with with you know the the funds that are left yeah yeah i i can definitely see that being a challenge so that was our first of six elements to help diffuse this time bomb what is our second element, Tim? Well, you know, I, I just referred to it. it. Was investment planning? So, wealth manager, big picture, working on the larger stewardship framework for you. But we still have to deal with the fact that we have investments, we have stocks and bonds and mutual funds, and we have all of these different things. What are we doing with them? How how do we use them? How do we use them well? How do we invest them well? So, um, if you have 10 different IRAs, 10 different 401ks. Do you remember the logins for each of them and which companies they're mm -hmm. at and yeah. how to access them and see how they're doing, make changes to the portfolio? Um, or are you just sticking everything in cash because you don't want to take a risk? Mm -hmm. Good. Uh, or, or, you know, there, there are elements to the investment piece that you really need to pay attention to. Now, that's just the basics of making sure that you're moving in the right direction. You layer on top of that a biblical aspect of being responsible with our investment decisions from a biblical perspective. We call that biblically responsible investing. Uh, and, and that's another layer of complexity. We're having someone who has the ability to help you diffuse a potential time bomb where either things aren't growing in the right, moving in the right direction, or they're not being handled well, or maybe even from a spiritual perspective, they're investing in things that are contradictory to the worldview that you believe is true and you want to succeed. So that's where this whole investment planning really does come into play. Tim, this biblically responsible investing that you just spoke about. If I'm correct in saying this for the individual that has set themselves up and is moving that, that is, it's a value based. It's, it's their values that they're using to drive their investments. Am I correct in saying that? Yeah. In this day and age, the term values based investing usually means something very different than what we mean. Okay. Um, so I don't disagree with you at all because right. I know what you mean when you say values. Um, maybe a better word to use would be c religious convictions. Yeah. Your religious convictions should uh, should in some way influence decisions that you make yeah. in your life and in your financial dealings. So if, if you believe that, you know, alcohol, tobacco, casino, pornography, abortion, these kinds of things are, are wrong and that, that they are morally offensive to God, should I be investing in those companies and profiting from their activities? Uh, pr probably not. Uh, th that wouldn't be a particularly good thing to do to bring honor and glory to the Lord. So you know, having an awareness of the fact that that's a thing and right. then an awareness of the fact that there are ways to, to do it well. So in our episodes 35 and 36, we address what is biblically responsible investing and then how to do biblical responsible investing. You can take a look at that and you can learn more about how you can implement that in your own life and in your own financial dealings, uh, or you work with someone who's able to help provide those solutions for you. Well said. Let's take a look at our third element in diffusing this time bomb uh, for busy stewards, and that is tax planning. Now, Tim, I know that this is one area that we have touched on in the Stewardology podcast, but as I did a review of our last episodes, really the first 99, we have not done an episode just on taxes. We've touched on various parts and nuances of taxes, but to say that we have done a somewhat exhaustive ec episode uh, on what the Bible says about taxes and our responsibility <laughs> and how to honor and com honor the command to pay them, well, uh, maybe it's actually time to start considering doing an episode on that. But Tim... Without great detail, share with our audience some of the top things that you do with your financial planning to help a couple, a family, better steward and honor the Lord through paying their taxes. 
or helping them pay less taxes legally, morally, and ethically. Ooh, I like that. Say <laughs> that again. Pay less taxes legally, morally, ethically. Nice. Um, so taxes are a big concern, obviously. We want to use tax-favored investments, right? So in, in many ways... Tax-favored. Explain uh, that. I will. I will. Yeah. In many ways, the discussion of wealth management, investment planning, and tax planning all interrelate. Because in order for me to do the best investment planning, I really need to think about it through the lens of taxes as well. So you can just save money in a joint investment account between you and your spouse. That that would be a wonderful thing to do. The negative tax consequence of doing that is that you could have a lot of money sitting in these accounts that may have grown substantially and to sell them, to rebalance them, to do anything with them would require realizing gains and paying taxes. Right. So whereas if you have a tax favored account, that would be like an IRA, 401k, Roth IRA, all of those activities, growth, capital gains, rebalancing, there's no tax consequences for that. So they're more tax favored. So if you're able to first step in retirement planning is to think about taxes and use tax favor vehicles. So that's why we say step number one with long-term savings, put your match into the 401k. If your company provides a match, if you put in 5%, we'll match 4%, then you ought to put in your 5%. That's right. the first step. Free money. Beyond that, make sure it's Roth IRA. Right. Why? Because we think about long-term tax planning. I would rather pay a little bit more tax today if I know that because of compounding, that little bit of tax is going to grow to a substantial number tax-free in the future. Right. That's better tax planning. You control your taxes by making sure you make that you pay that tax bill today at today's rate rather than tomorrow at tomorrow's rate. Correct. Especially when tomorrow might be decades from now. Yeah. Yeah. So um, looking at the kinds of accounts that we're using are important. But there are some clients that I have who who are maxing out their 401k. They're behind in their retirement savings because they've been focused on getting their kids through college debt free. Praise Jesus. That was a good call. But now they feel like they're behind the eight ball. They've mm -hmm. got to save up as much money as they can. So they're putting away thousands of dollars a month because they have a good income into a, a joint type of investment account. Well, if we use mutual funds, like I've done with a, a couple of my clients like this, uh, that can create tax burdens for years like last year. They didn't sell anything, but because they hold it in mutual funds, the mutual fund itself must sell shares internally within that particular Correct. fund. Correct. And if they bought that holding 20 years ago mm. to the point where it is today, we could have a year where the market's down and they'd sell a position that's in a gain and they have to pass on to you a capital gains distribution. Right. That can become really taxable, problematically taxable for some of my clients who have a lot of mutual funds. That's why – we a we pay attention to what's happening with capital gains. We want to see a copy of the tax return every year. So if you're working with a financial advisor, they should be asking you for a copy of your tax return every that's, year. That's a critical piece. It Am really I right? Tim? Is. You can't do tax planning without all of the data. The second thing they need to be doing or think about is if taxes are becoming a problem, look for an opportunity to shift the focus over to exchange traded funds because for non-retirement savings for money outside of a retirement account that you're saving, using ETFs is more tax favorable than a mutual fund because they don't have to do as much with capital gains distributions. Explain an ETF really quickly. ETFs are exchange traded funds. They're very similar to mutual funds in that they are um, a single investment that is made up or comprises many different stocks and or bonds. The difference is a couple fold. First of all, whereas a mutual fund, the price changes only once a day Correct. at the end of market. Correct. An ETF is priced all throughout the day. Oh, really? So you can buy and sell throughout the day. That That's one significant difference. The other significant difference is that they are not forced to sell 
the underlying investments and then buy another investment, they can exchange one investment for another or one stock for another stock. Okay. The difference there is if they're not selling it, getting cash and buying a new one, like a mutual fund has to do that realizes a gain and they are forced to pass that gain on to investors. An ETF can simply take one stock, exchange it for another stock that thereby they're allowed to bypass capital gains because it's an exchange rather than a sale. I just learned something new. Yeah. That yeah. makes a lot of sense. And, and the way the, the way the regulations read ETFs are allowed to do that where mutual funds are not allowed to do that. Interesting. Interesting. Um, now I would love for mutual funds to get fixed so that that's, this isn't a problem for them either, but until that day, that's the so, area. Tim, without great detail, share with our audience some of the top things that you do with your financial planning to help a couple or family become better stewards and honor the Lord through the obedience of paying their taxes. What are some of the top things that you do? You've already talked about a few things here, but what else? Well, I'm recording this at the end of 2020, right? 2022. And it's a bad year for the stock market. One of the things we do is we do tax loss harvesting. So for those individuals who have a lot of non-retirement money, we'll look to take some losses in, in some down years to be able to offset capital gains. Oh, okay. So that's one helpful way to do it. Another thing that we do is Roth conversions. We mm -hmm. work on, especially if the market's down, now's a great time to convert some of those funds into a Roth IRA so that all of the growth can be entirely tax-free. Essentially, your tax bill just went on sale. Mm -hmm. So take advantage of that. Uh, the other things that we'll do is we'll look at, okay, this is going to get a little tax nerdy, but for those of you who are on Medicare, right, 65 and older, you have Medicare Part A, B, and D. There's also a Part C, which is called Medicare Advantage. Those premiums are based upon your income, and if you make too much income, there's something called IRMA. It's a tax on those who make too much income, which causes your premiums to go up substantially by hundreds of dollars a month. So we look at tax maneuvers within the client's, you know, tax return or tax year to make sure that they're not going to get over that Irma threshold mm. to the extent possible. It's not always possible, right? There's a lot of moving parts, but we at least are aware that Irma exists and we try to maybe avoid doing a Roth conversion in a year that might cause Irma. And maybe defer it to a later year when income may be lower. So we, we pay attention to those things. So make your contributions to your IRAs and Roth IRAs. That always helps with taxes either today by putting it into a traditional or tomorrow by putting it into a Roth IRA. Um, make sure you do your tax, your, your um, Roth conversions. We'll also talk about charitable giving and thinking about outside the way, outside the box ways of doing charitable giving, whether it's uh, giving cash or giving shares of mutual funds that's or stocks. My next, that's my next question. Yep. How, or, how, how does someone be able to satisfy IRS tax requirements but still be generous or even more generous to their local church? Yeah. So donate those highly appreciated shares of stock, right? Yeah. If you have a stock that's – you bought it for $10, it's worth 50 today. If you sell it, you have a $50 capital gain. If you donate it, you get no capital gain. You get the $50 charitable deduction, if you itemize, you can take that to offset other taxes. What does a church need to be able to receive A, a brokerage that? account, typically. You just have to establish a brokerage account for the, the church has to establish a brokerage account, and that share needs to be transferred to the church. The church sells it. They're tax exempt. They pay no taxes on it. They get the income, and then you get the tax credit. So if somebody would like to do that for their local church, reach out to your pastor or trustee or elder, find out if they have a brokerage account, and if they yeah. do, go ahead and do that. If they don't, that's something Encourage that a, them to get something a church in. could set one up without yeah. without too much trouble. Yeah. Encourage them to get that set up, yeah. It, it does depend on how old the church is. If churches, their financial records are not in good order, it could be a bear to set up a brokerage account, but it's worth it to get it done. Again, get your house in order, get your finances and documents in order, especially for old churches. It's a hard thing, but it's an important thing. 
It very, very much so. We like to say here at the Stewardology Podcast and Life Financial Group and at our seminars with Life Institute, give unto Caesars what is Caesars, but there's a little subscript in the Greek there. It says, but not a penny more. You're a Greek scholar, Tim. Is, is it there? I'm pretty sure it's not there. Oh, but, it's you know, not there. It, so they didn't have pennies? Maybe it's in the Drew version. It's probably in the Drew version, but not a penny more. But... Another way to do that is instead of taking an RMD, required minimum distribution for those who are 70 and a half and older, I know RMDs are 72, but you can do a QCD at 70 and a half under current law. You can do your QCD. That's a qualified charitable distribution. So instead of taking an RMD, you donate it to your church. So do your charitable giving out of your IRAs. It's a qualified charitable distribution for those who are 70 and a half and above. How does that save a person taxes? Well, because they don't receive the taxable income or they can essentially write off the taxability of that income by virtue of the fact that it was donated directly. You didn't receive the cash. The money was paid directly to the church. That's, that's a great way to be generous to, to the local church. It is. Wonderful thing. So well, lots of different ways to be tax wise. This is just scratching the surface. Okay. So we've now looked at three different elements to defuse a time bomb. Number four is insurance planning. Talk to us about that, Tim. When it comes to risk, you can either absorb the risk, you know, assume it yourself, mm-hmm. hope to self-insure. You can just ignore the risk. Uh, and just pray that nothing bad happens, or you can transfer the risk. That means working with an insurance company, paying a premium, and they will assume the risk if something bad happens. So this is on your home, your car, your health, right? Your health insurance, Mm -hmm. your life, your life insurance, even long-term care. These are all different ways of transferring risk. If you own a vehicle, you have to have car insurance. That's a no-brainer. Yep. If you have a mortgage, you have to have a home insurance. And frankly, even if you don't have a mortgage, I'd hope you have home insurance. Sure. It's a good idea. Beyond that, uh, there are other kinds of insurances that are important to consider. If you don't have enough money to to provide for your loved ones if you pass away right now, you should have life insurance. Yeah. So for those of you who are on the younger age, uh, younger end of the age spectrum, if you're not paying attention to this and you contract a, a disease, a condition that prevents you from getting life insurance in the future, that's a problem. That's a time bomb that you can diffuse by getting a term policy when you're young. And that's what you recommend to him, a term policy? Cause... Yeah. Let me get to that in a minute. When I was 26, 27, I got a 20 year term policy Mm -hmm. for a million dollars. I paid $420 a year. Okay. A year. That's great. That's the cost for a million dollars of protection. If I were to die within 20 years of when I got that policy, my wife would receive a million dollar death benefit that would help carry her through these child rearing years and get her to the point where she would have an asset with which she could hopefully retire with, right? Right. Could replace some of my income. That is why I look at insurance and I generally recommend term for younger people. Now in the world of insurance, and I'm not going to do a whole insurance episode here. I think we actually already have one on this in our, in our backlog, but there's two kinds. We have whole life insurance. We have term insurance, whole life insurance is for your whole life. You'll be paying a premium until you die. I I don't believe that that's probably the best way to go. It's not wrong necessarily. It's not evil, but it's often oversold and missold because it's more in the financial best interests of the insurance agent than it is perhaps in your best interests. That's not universally the case, but sometimes it is. Sure. If you are young, you need much more insurance. You could not afford that amount in whole life insurance. So whole life is for those who have substantial means and who want to build cash value as part of another or different kinds of strategy, not about income replacement. If you're just trying to protect income, Term insurance is the way to go. So we've talked about life insurance. We talked about um, another one I think you didn't touch on is long-term care insurance. Yeah, yeah. I mentioned it as one of the insurances, but that's another one that's really important. Uh, I was – so insurance – long-term care insurance is so frustrating right now. Um, If everybody could see Tim's face right now. I have – 
I have so many clients right now who, who would like to buy whole life insurance, but I don't have a lot of really great options for them. Uh, I, I'm working on it. I'm, I'm, I've got a couple ideas that we're kind of fleshing out and we're still trying to see where things land as rates start to stabilize because we're in this really strong rate increase era. Um, but it's really aggravating because I was just on the phone before we started recording podcast today with one of my clients. He's in his late seventies and he got a 25% premium increase on his long-term care insurance. Seriously? I wow. am not kidding. It was nearly $2,000 was his premium. It went up to over $2,500. Ouch. They said you can either do one of three, one of four things you can reduce your inflation rider from two point whatever percent to one percent you can um take the uh take some coinsurance and you assume 15 percent coinsurance so we'll only pay 85 percent of the bill you'll cover the rest wow you can uh reduce your monthly benefit from 400 to 300 a, a day wow or you can uh pay us eighty six thousand dollars and not have to worry about any more any more premiums Wow. The guy's in his late seventies. He he's not got the you know eighty some thousand dollars to kick into the policy. Right. You know to drop his benefit by twenty five percent from four hundred to three hundred a day was not a good option. No. To to take the co insurance option is not a good option. The best thing for him and what we ended up choosing to do was to reduce the compound growth from two whatever percent to one percent. Wow. And the rationale there is he's had this policy for a long time with a big inflation rider, which got his daily benefit up to about $400. I'd like to keep it there. Right. I don't mind growing it at a slower rate, even though inflation's high right now. I don't mind growing it at a slower rate because it's more likely he's going to either A, need it before too long, or he's going to pass away before too long, or Jesus is going to come back before too long. Uh, that's my hope. So. so it's it's a win 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 right now. So I would rather I'd rather have a little less growth and keep what we have. Yeah, our hope is that using one's insurance is never needed for the families that we serve. But as we know, there are no guarantees except sure. for our eternal life in Christ. We have that guarantee. But planning to make sure that our family is taken care of in these challenging family altering times. Well, that's part of wise stewardship, and it's also a good use of the resources that God has given to us. Before we wrap up this idea of long-term care insurance, though, I do want to say I just vented on long-term care insurance and why it's so frustrating to me. It's really important to get. I still encourage it. I still recommend it in spite of some of the frustrations that some of my older policies have been experiencing. Yeah. Okay. So I don't want to dissuade you from getting the insurance. It's definitely good. Look into those options. I'm hoping to have better options soon to be able to talk to some of my clients that are asking about these things. Uh, the last thing I do want to say, there's one more type of insurance I think would be beneficial to be aware of, and that is an umbrella policy. Oh, um, it, it's something that's tied in is with your for auto days? insurance for rainy days. It kind of is. So it's instead of rainy days, think about liability risk and you have a, a car our insurance policy, you have a homeowner's insurance policy. Those have liability limits, right. personal liability. So someone sues you, someone you're, someone's borrowing your car to go run an errand. They hit a pedestrian. The pedestrian dies. The family sues the person who is driving, who doesn't have any insurance and then sues you because it's your car. Right. That is a personal liability lawsuit. If they go after $5 million and your limit is only $250,000. You have a big gap, right? You can get an umbrella policy for a relatively small amount of money. That's an overarching protection to help make sure that you're, you're not at great risk of those kind of, of liability situations. The thing you need to be aware of is working with an agent, um, a, a, a homeowner's a personal lines agent who's able to make sure you're coordinating your level of, of protection so that you don't have gaps. So I'll give you an example. If if my car insurance liability limit is at 250 and I get an umbrella policy, the umbrella policy, their limit's going to kick in at 500,000. Mm -hmm. So in other words, I need to have my car insurance limit up to 500. 
and I need to have make sure that that coordinates with my umbrella policy so that there's no there's no gap. Right. Right. Um, and then that I have a million or two million dollar l- umbrella liability policy to protect me. This is for me. It's a because I'm a business owner. Um because I have a house with a pool, because I have young kids and young drivers, all of these are risk factors. If you own rental properties, if you have, you know, other kind of funky things going on, you own a boat. Uh, these are areas where it would benefit you from having an umbrella policy and the cost is relatively small. We're talking about two, three, four hundred dollars a year based on the size and need and the amount of risk that you're dealing with. I can vouch for that that very small fee for it. My wife and I, we live out in the countryside. We have a pond in our front yard. It's literally 10 feet from the road. There's no fence around the property. We're out, like I said, in the countryside. My wife and I decided for safety's sake, it would be wise to have an umbrella policy. So we have a $1 million umbrella policy because we want to have kids come over from youth groups to come over and fishing and have picnics and parties and bonfires all on our property. And we just want to make sure that we're covered if an accident would happen, if somebody would drive down the road and drive into our pond or somebody gets a hook in an eye or something like that from fishing. We want to make sure that, number one, those people are taken care of, but we also are taken care of. So we thought when we first bought the property that it would be good and wise to get this umbrella policy to give that overarching protection for us moving forward. Let's talk about this next one, Tim. Charitable planning. I know this is one that is dear to you and your dad's heart. Mm, Yeah. We give, right? Sometimes we'll we'll give to church and the building campaign and maybe a missionary, but is there a comprehensive look at the kind of charitable giving you're doing and the most tax effective way of doing your charitable giving? You see how all these things start to interrelate, right? How does taxes relate to charitable giving? And also how does that relate to investment planning? Cause we talked about, you know, donating out of your, your IRAs via the QCD qualified charitable distribution, donating highly appreciated shares of stock. All of these have tax implications and charitable giving implications. Are they coordinated in the most effective way? This is why working with someone who's able to look at the big picture, not just have a tax person and an investment person and a planning person and an insurance person, having someone who's able to look at the whole picture can really help you do well. Drew, you have a couple of verses here. Why don't you share a couple of those with us? Yeah, one of my favorite ones is Second Corinthians 9, verses 6 and 7. It says, remember this, whoever sows sparingly will also reap sparingly, and whoever sows generously will also reap generously. Each of you should give what you have decided in your heart to give, not reluctantly or under compulsion, for God loves a cheerful giver. So we have this right here that the Lord is saying, hey, it's not just giving, but it's the heart behind it. And Proverbs 11.25 says, a generous person will prosper. Whoever refreshes another will be refreshed. Psalm 112 verse 5 says, good will come to those who are generous and lend freely. And Luke 6.30, it says, give to everyone who asks, and if anyone takes what belongs to you, do not demand it back. So we talk about these pillars of charitable planning. It's important to note that it's not just for today, but it's for tomorrow also. Yeah, yeah. So we're talking about time bombs, right? Yeah. How is charitable planning an element to help eliminate a time bomb? Let me let me answer that question because I think it's a question you should be asking. Yeah. The answer is, look, if your money is all about you, you're not going to be giving. You're going to be heaping it all up. And, and, you know, it, money is like manure in a pile. It does nothing good, but stink, but it does a tremendous amount of good if you spread it out. So there, that's a time bomb for you because it's, it's devastating to your soul. You can be like the rich fool who said, I have many, uh, I have much good saved up for many years. Yeah. I can sit back, eat, drink, and be merry. And the Lord said, you fool, this night your life will be required of you. There is a time bomb for you trusting in your wealth. The best way of preventing money from becoming toxic to your soul, toxic to your faith, is to give. 
You give not because God needs your money. You give because you need to be reminded that God matters more than money. That is why charitable planning is so important, but you need to do charitable planning in a smart way, in a way that's going to coordinate with taxes, with investment, with the big picture. So have all of this as part of that overarching plan is going to be hugely helpful. And the important thing to know is these tax codes and charitable planning rules and regulations, they fluctuate at a regular base. Am I right in saying stay on top of it? Yeah. So that's why it's so important to have somebody who knows and understands us. Tim, we're up to our final time bomb that we need to diffuse. And that is estate planning. (laughs) Stewardship doesn't end at death, does it, Tim? Yeah. I I don't know why this shows up as the last of the time bomb elements. This is probably one of the biggest time bomby elements that people will get. Time bomby. I like that. Yeah. Yeah. So you need to have a will. Yeah. You need to have a power of attorney, you and your spouse. If your children are over 18, they need to have that too. I say that and remind myself, Tim, your son's 18. You should probably start thinking about this. Mm. Um, So we have to realize that it is appointed unto man wants to die. And after that, the judgment, well, we're dealing with the, after that, the judgment by putting our faith in Jesus Christ, you cannot save yourself. It is only by the grace of Jesus Christ, by putting your entire hope for eternal salvation on him alone in his final completed work on the cross that you can avoid the judgment. But what about the at death? There's no way for us to avoid that unless the Lord comes back first. So we have to take that seriously and we have to be prepared to transfer our stewardship and estate planning is the process that we make sure that our assets can be well cared for in our lifetime and upon our death, that they can be transferred to the next generation effectively and in a way that honors your intentions, that honors the Lord and demonstrates that money is not the most important thing to our family. Jesus is. Am I right in saying, Tim, that through proper estate planning, you are also you can transfer to the, to your kids and to others in your family. And you can do it in a way that actually reduces taxes. If you set it up properly, am I right in saying that? Yeah. Yeah. Um, so individuals who decide that they want to be charitable, uh, with their estate planning, they may say give 10% or 20% to X, Y, Z church or 5% to this church and 5% to this thing and 5% to that thing. Great. Uh, if you want to do that, praise Jesus. I think that's a wonderful thing to do. Mm-hmm. Think about for a moment where the money's going to come from to fund that charitable bequest. It's only going to come from monies that flow through your estate. What is not going to flow through your estate is anything with a beneficiary. So your IRAs, your 401ks, your annuities, your life insurance, all of that bypasses the will. They do not flow through the estate. They are not available to satisfy that charitable desire. The problem is that the money that's going to solve that charitable intent is going to come from your bank accounts, from your stock holdings that are outside of your IRAs, and from your home equity. Yeah, the sales. Right? Yes. So in other words, all of those assets are essentially income tax-free to your heirs, and they're going to a tax-exempt organization. Whereas you're leaving all of your taxable assets, your IRAs and 401ks and annuities, to children who pay taxes. An alternative scenario would be rather than doing this big bequest in the will to give X percentage to to a charity, you can say, I'd like to give a certain percentage to charities, but I've indicated that by my IRA beneficiaries. That way you give out of your IRAs and your 401ks. These dollars are fully taxable to your kids. You want to give to charity out of that because charities don't pay taxes under current tax law. I hate that I have to keep on saying that, but right. you know, at some point that's going to become a problem. This way we're able to be a little bit more tax wise in how we do our giving. Very, very well said. So the big question before us is how do we diffuse this this time bomb that's that's right here in front of us? Hmm. And 
we basically call need the to, bomb squad. We call the bomb squad. What's the bomb squad? A great financial advisor. Uh, they need to understand these six elements. They need to understand how they weave together to bring about the right elements so that in the process of estate planning, proper estate planning, one of these fuses do not get lit and things blow up. You need to seek out someone that's trustworthy who knows how to put all these pieces together. I did a little research for this episode, and I saw an article written by Ryan Nelson, and the link is in our show notes. And this is what he says. The Bible doesn't explicitly say, you are a steward of God's resources, but this title has always been the way Christians understand our relationship to God and our possessions, because the Bible makes it clear that everything belongs to God, he entrusts some things to us, and we have responsibility to manage them wisely on his behalf. Then he continues to say, biblical stewardship challenges us to recognize that God is the true owner of everything and that he expects us to manage his resources in a certain way. I thought that was well said. And I would go even go a step further, that it's not just a certain way to manage those resources, but we ought to do it his way. As we see in the various uh, various passages of Scripture that we spoke about earlier and ones in the Scriptures that deal with money, finances, and stewardship, every Christian should have a good financial plan, one that's organized to encompass all that they've talked about. So they can live out and demonstrate what is true, what is biblical, what is wise financial stewardship. All these six pillars work together, wealth planning, investment planning, tax planning, insurance planning, charitable planning, and estate planning. And in order to have a successful life and wealth transitions, we need to plan. And setting up intentional stewardship plan with these six elements, they will defuse this time bomb that could actually be sitting in their lap. So if you leave just one of these elements out of the picture, your financial plan very well could have a fuse that kind of gets lit, and now you're going to have to deal with that explosion at a later time. Successful transitions require careful planning and thought, which cut the fuse of a potential time bomb. The problem is that planning is hard work, and it's easier to put it off to another day, and procrastination keeps us from making those major life changes and transitions when it comes to our investing, tax planning, and wealth management. It's overwhelming. How can I be a good steward of all this stuff? Well, here at the Stewardology Podcast and the Life Financial Group, we offer wealth management from a uniquely biblical worldview. If you're having trouble figuring this all out, we can help you take that complicated financial situation that you're in, diffuse it, and turn it into a beautiful, comprehensive plan that works specifically for you and your family. Don't let any of these hidden time bombs or the complicated nature of finances stop your forward progress. We can help make it easier for you. How do, we, how do you do that? We talk about it often. Schedule your free personal stewardship review on our website where we can help look at all six of these features and put a good comprehensive plan together to help you become an even better steward. We'd like to thank you for joining us today on the Stewardology Podcast. Please be sure to uh, like and review our podcast on your podcast catcher. Go to the stewardologypodcast.com forward slash ideas to share your ideas for future podcast episodes. And remember to go visit our show notes for more exciting resources and details. Until next time, take care. God bless. And remember, moreover, it is required of a steward that they be found faithful. Thank you for joining us on the Stewardology Podcast, where financial stewardship and theology meet. We'd like to help you take your next steps in biblical financial stewardship. First, subscribe in your podcast provider to get the newest episode delivered to you every week. Next, follow us on social media. 
and visit our website at stewardologypodcast.com. There you can find our social media links and our entire episode archive. Remember, some trust in chariots and some trust in horses, but we trust in the name of the Lord our God. See you next week on the Stewardology Podcast. Securities and advisory services offered through Genius Wealth Management, member FINRA and SIPC.